Achieving universal access to modern energy services is vital prerequisite to advancing social and economic development. However, it has been estimated that around 587 million people lack access to electricity in Africa. If no initiatives are taken in improving energy access, then this number is likely to increase by 10% in 2030, with 655 million having no access to electricity. Access to electrification stands at 68.9%, with rural access rates almost half of urban areas. Sub-Saharan Africa falls way below the national average uh, rural electrification rate at 12%. Therefore, rural Africa presents tremendous opportunities for expansion of market-based solutions. The consumption side presents a catch-22 situation. With electricity access being low, economic activities are largely reduced, resulting in low average per capita consumption in sub-Saharan Africa at 153 kilowatt hour per year, with, which is just about 6% of the global average. Market-based solutions utilizing renewable energy presents tremendous opportunity in Africa. At present, renewable energy forms less than 20% of the total electrification, electricity generation. Hydro forms 93% of the total RE installed capacity, with solar, solar bagasse, and, and wind with forming less than 5%, providing immense scope for exploitation of these resources. Looking into the future, in order to improve access to electricity, various options for supplying electricity needs need to be considered, including on-grid, mini-grid, as well as off-grid solutions. Decentralized solutions have an important role to play where grid connection is too expensive in rural and remote regions. According to IEA estimates, around 60% of the additional generation capacity need, needed for universal access to electricity in Africa will come from standalone and off-grid solutions. To achieve this, IEA estimates that USD 390 billion cumulative investments are required between 2010 and 2030, yet the total funding to the energy sector in sub-Saharan Africa averages to only about USD 2 billion every year. Therefore, the energy sector in general faces serious challenges with respect to mobilizing finance. In this context, it would be interesting to discuss what market-based solutions are needed to improve the lives and productivity of millions of rural households and businesses across sub-Saharan Africa that have no access to electricity. How can private capital be mobilized to scale up these business models? Now, I would like to call upon our esteemed panelists to come up on stage. I would request our panel moderator, Charlotte Ward, to take over the discussion. Charlotte Ward is program manager for GSMA's mobile-enabled community services, which helps to improve access to, which helps to provide improved access to energy and water services for underserved communities worldwide using mobile infrastructure and technology. Their core activities include grants, research, knowledge sharing, and market development. Previously, she has worked in environmental finance business development and consulting in East Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. She has extensive exp experience in business development and capital ma markets across the globe. Okay. Uh, quick, yeah. Yeah. Over, over to you, Charlotte. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to briefly just introduce the panel and then they'll have an opportunity when they answer their first question to give it a bit more of a background uh, about their organisation and, and who they are. So starting from my left, I have um, Richard Gomes, who's Head of Policy and Advocacy at the Shell Foundation. Then moving round, uh, we have Patrick Huber, who's the Regional Manager for Africa for Responsibility Investments. Then um, Paul Okesh who is a director at One Degree Solar, based in Nairobi as well. Then I have Mark Hankins, um, who is the director of African Solar Designs. And then um, Andrew Huskovich, who is the coordinator of Power Africa and Trade Africa at USAID. And then uh, last but not least, we have Bobby Namiti, who is the East Africa coordinator of the Climate Technology Initiative's Private Financing Advisory Network. 
So first of all, what I'd like us to do is to explore how improving energy access at affordable prices in off-grid markets requires innovation in business models. Richard, I have a, a question for you, and if you could just first also um, introduce yourself a little bit more, sure. and then tell me what do you see as being the role of the private sector in bringing innovative models to the front? Sure, glad to. Um, sorry. So, thanks Charlotte, and thanks very much uh, to everyone for having us on the panel. Um, just a quick overview of Shell Foundation's involvement. Um, we've been working on the issue of access to energy as one of three uh, major global development challenges that we uh, try to address for the last 14 years. Um, and our approach to do that has been to identify the market failures that underpin some of these challenges mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to work with a small, small portfolio of pioneers uh, to create and scale business solutions to those challenges. Um, I guess as a starting point, we've had a lot of experience over the last 14 years, some successes, some failures, mm. um, but that an interesting point to make might be that we have seen strong evidence of demand um, coming through from low-income customers mm. for affordable and reliable products, energy products and services. Um, so I think across our portfolio, um, you know, D-Light having sold four million uh, solar lights, Envirofit approaching a million uh, clean cook stoves, Hus Power in India um, providing off-grid electricity to 200,000 people. So, you know, strong evidence of demand. I think I would inject sort of three notes of sort of reality checks, if you like, uh, into, into the discussion. One would be that our experience is that uh, catalyzing this innovation is extremely difficult. Uh, the second would be that when you think about where this innovation comes from, the pioneers behind it, mm -hmm. there is a significant first mover disadvantage um, that they face. So if I think about the research and development that needs to go into new technologies, uh, that needs to go into understanding consumer demands and wants, you know, the fact that they have to build supply chains from scratch, the market barriers they face in terms of awareness, uh, in terms of affordability, uh, in terms of distribution or, or lack of standards, um, then really it is impossible for them to do this alone. Mm -hmm. the, the third reality check that I'd probably inject is that it is extremely rare, you know, very, very rare, if not um, unseen, to see public or commercial funding catalyzing this innovation. So it's a early stage support for, for game changers. Mm -hmm. So where does that come from? And I guess that's probably a more, a more positive note would be a trend um, that maybe there is an interesting role for foundations with mm -hmm. access to uh, risk tolerant and private capital to offset some of that risk and mm -hmm. unlock those private markets. Um, and that's probably by providing a blend of early stage um, grant support, patient support, mm -hmm. plus business skills and market links to pioneers, mm -hmm. and also to take a market building role um, to create the infrastructure around those pioneers. And I guess all I would say, just to, to, to finish the question, would be that we do have some examples of that now starting to, to come through. So one. Uh, of our portfolio companies that Charlotte will be quite familiar with is Mcopa, mm -hmm. um, and they uh, really smart mobile technology company that can make solar products and energy products affor affordable for low income consumers uh, by uh, uh, essentially offering a form of smart credit um, and then they pay buy installments on their mobile phones uh, as as they use energy um, and after a few months they own the the unit. Mm -hmm. um, and MCOPA is a great story because we were the first grant funder in, in, in MCOPA, I think around uh, four to five years ago. And we've maybe invested something like $3 million of grant funding in that time. But MCOPA's trajectory towards scale and sustainability has been such that they've then been able to show performance, validate their model, develop the technology, and, and prove to the next stage of investors, the so development financiers or mm -hmm. impact investors, uh, that they have... Um, that they're ready to, to serve harder forms of finance. And last week, they, they managed to close a deal with the Commercial Bank of Africa for $10 million of commercial debt. So just an example of how you can use sort of risk tolerant private foundation capital to seed these sustainable solutions. Yeah. Agree. Um, could, I have a question now for Paul. Um, could you distinguish me perhaps the role of homegrown players with overseas entrants and you may like to consider their position in the, along the value chain. Okay. <coughs> Could you uh, just introduce yourself as well, please? Okay. Uh, good mo uh, I think it's good afternoon now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my name is Paul Oketch, and um, I'm the um, 
basically representing uh, one degree in this region. And uh, I also have my colleague here from, uh, I think Albert Wong is here also, uh, who is uh, championing our financial inclusion uh, project. And um, to, just to give you a background, one degree, we are a one product at the moment uh, company. We are we, in, our, in the category we are in, in the solar home systems. And we are an uh, early stage, uh, basically, uh, company. And I think I, li I like what uh, my colleague from Shell has said about uh, what the impact of the investments can do to companies like ourselves. Uh, in relation to your question, I, I don't, um, I, I think I, th I thought through and I have uh, looked at the statistics, and I think there's a lot more uh, manufacturers from outside uh, within the within the sector we are in, and I think largely due to the uh, the barriers to design, uh, manufacturing, and also I think the ge generic environment of the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I think most of the, uh, the the entrepreneurs who are in this sector and the manufacturers are um, basically from uh, uh, from outside, where either startup capital is easier to get. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I think huge, uh, huge startup capital is easier to access. Uh, I think the experience for maybe the, the, the from what I've seen in the value chain is uh, like we are. We're in the manufacturing sector, the design sector. So a lot of the home players tend to tend to talk of take their place within the lower side of the distribution value chain. You'll find them either as distributors. Uh, you have uh, Teles Telesolar, you, I think there we have about uh, 17 from what I, I saw, the statistics I looked at yesterday. And we have also the last mile entrepreneurs where the barriers to entry in this sector is lower. Mm -hmm. So a lot more players there. And uh, I think that's, that's what I can sort okay. of share for now. Thanks. Thanks. Um, if you could pass the mic to Patrick um, on this side. Patrick, looking as an investor, um, what have been your key learnings and your experiences while investing in this sector? If you could first give us a bit of introduction about responsibility investments. Okay. Thank you. Um, so responsibility, we're a regulated asset manager in uh, Switzerland with offices around the world and we're a growth stage investor. So we're not innovative. <laughs> but we're, you know, we're, we're bringing things to scale. We now manage 1.9 billion US dollars. It's growing. A lot of pension funds, family offices are coming to us and want to invest in the sector. Um, so energy, we started looking at energy about three years ago. And we now, uh, last month, closed a, a holding company which will invest at early stages and then own, own an uh, build on and operate power, power plants in the renewable energy sector. So that's one thing we now launch. And uh, we're currently working on an exciting project with uh, the Shell Foundation and IFC um, on bringing a working capital fund for... Um, this one? Okay. Uh, we have now been working on an exciting project with Shell Foundation on a working capital fund for uh, solar... Uh, solar and cook stove uh, companies um, to really bridge their working capital needs. So uh, key learnings for a later stage investor, I mean, it's a very early market. So if you look at on-grid stuff and mini-grids, policies in place, sites are there, but no experience or very little experience in uh, project development. And the financing that's around is more private equity and not long-term investments. So you know, for projects, you need a, I don't know, 15, 20 year time horizon and there's five year money around. So, okay, so you know, the, the, the market is not yet right for the, the current money. Um, and if you look at off-grid, the key learnings changed every year. So if you look back, like 2009, the key, po the key question was, what kind of product do we need? Then it went on, you know, um, what kind of business model do we, do we uh, want to apply? For example, MCOPA, they thought that they were not sure in 2010, are they an IT company or are they a, a finance company? And I think now they're a finance company. So um, 
And uh, I mean, then kind of finding out about distribution and end user finance, I think that was the next, next key learning. And uh, I think we're getting now to a point where companies find this out. So we have uh, Delight. Uh, I think they're get really, very, good, very good at selecting, um, selecting distributors. MCOPA cracked the, the end user finance part. So uh, I mean, now I think it's getting very, ex very interesting for a later stage investor. Uh, and that's why we're, we're ready now. <laughs> yeah. It, your, your question has many faces. I tried to sort of think through how best to do this so that uh, we, we can communicate to the audience. I think I looked at it from the point of uh, the distribution value chain. Uh, I think for manufacturers, basically, the challenges would be uh, policy. For example, in Kenya, uh, prior to January, pri prior to some time last year, we had a, a zero rated tax uh, sort of environment. So uh, it was very easy to enter the market. Uh, but immediately after some time in January, uh, they slapped, I think sometime in October, they slapped a VAT close on it. So those are, I would say, regulatory challenges that manufacturers can face. The other would be, of course, the working capital uh, challenges with the manufacturer. If your business grows too fast, uh, we had a similar case where we got an order worth close to a quarter of a million dollars, but uh, what do we do? At that point, uh, you have to, do you finance it because your customer doesn't have uh, uh, the ability to, to pay you upfront? So as a manufacturing, those are some of the working capital challenges can be real, especially if the demand sort of, uh, your, your demand forecast is not, uh, sort of outstrips your, the demand outstrips your earlier forecast. Now, if you come down a little bit to the distributor level, the distributor would be excited about the product, about the uh, going into the energy uh, area. Then he suddenly finds that the cost of distributing the product uh, is slightly eating into his uh, anticipated margin. So again, here we have a practical experience where we are, we are forced to go back to the drawing board to renegotiate the margins. Uh, then this is a real uh, challenge for for manufacturers uh, who would like to use the distributor model. Uh, down the chain, if you go to the retailers, uh, again, is the issue of um, uh, are the retailers, is this an additional product to their portfolio or is this an exclusive product in their portfolio? Again, it depends on the awareness that has been done, but Kenya is lucky, I don't know about other countries, because Lighting Africa had done a, a bit of awareness of their category. So the adoption was much easier because Lighting Af Africa had invested a lot of money in this area. When you come to the last mile entrepreneurs who are basically individuals who are uh, helping uh, in the energy sector, both in cook stoves and solar, you find that uh, programs like Endev uh, have been able to address some of the challenges of capacity building that you'd normally face at this particular area. And also, when you recruit some of these players into your distribution value chain, then the GIZ and the SNV would be able to sort of support uh, in this area. So I would say that some of the challenges are there, but they've been sorted out by interventions, either by development finance institutions or other players within the um, ecosystem. And I like the concept of ecosystem that IntelCAP is bringing about because this is what will uh, actually uh, make the industry thrive. The last one is the after sale side, which is uh, if you have a product that requires or has, is uh, operating under warranty, then what happens when it comes back? What happens when it's, uh, it's at the end of its useful life? Again, the ecosystem, for example, in Kenya, I think there's, there's only one company, uh, Excite, that has a buyback policy. So for an early stage uh, party like us, we cannot be able to uh, sort of fund this and we sort of piggy ride on uh, the ecosystem that exists in the market. I'm not so sure whether other African countries have this uh, privilege, but we do, so we take advantage. But I guess uh, end of useful uh, life would be a big problem for warranties under one year. And uh, of course, the type of batteries also that you use within the solar sector would be, uh, is it um, a lead acid? Is it uh, 
the lithium, again, the issue of disposing them, that also has not been addressed. The little I've read, again, is still a challenge out there. Uh, so these are just the uh, typical issues. When it comes to financing at the end user level, uh, if you look at the typical client at the off-grid, then he may not have the entire capital. So he may, he may start off, so that's why if you look at the statistics of Lighting Africa, uh, almost 94% of the sales are for products on lighting below uh, $40. So those tend to do very well. But in our category where we are pushing products above $100, you find that the uptake, if you look at the statistics, uh, is less than um, 4%. Yeah, so again, the challenge there would be the adoption of the category by the end user, again, the ability, affordability, again, of the end user, and also the, 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 the capacity of the value chain, last mile entrepreneur and the resellers to be able to stock this. Uh, products that are higher value for a longer time. Okay. I think uh, that's what Great. I can, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, could you pass the microphone to Mark? Uh, Mark, could, could you tell me a little bit from your experiences, what challenges you've faced and what you've had to do to overcome them at African Solar Designs? African Solar Designs are consultants and project managers, and we like to think of ourselves as thought leaders. And I've been in the solar industry in Kenya since I was a volunteer here in, in the 80s. Um, I think ecosystem is a good word. Let's look at Kenya in terms of the ecosystem of electricity. And let's not even talk about wood stoves now. Let's talk about the ecosystem of electricity. We have two, e two separate sides. We have on-grid and off-grid. Now, we have a government and a middle class and an elite and a business sector which is very worried about the electricity sector. Electricity sector gets hundreds of millions of dollars of public sector investment every year and it, 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 uh, it's, every electricity connection is subsidized by about $1,000 per connection. And the government's view is that everyone's going to be electrified by whatever the year they've set now. I mean, I'm old enough that I came here and I remember when the targets were set for 2000 and it was 100% for 2000 in the 80s. Um, I can tell you we're not going to get there. So, and the other government view on the, on the big power sector is that we want to drive the price down. We want, to, we want to use cheap sources of power like coal and LNG. Solar and wind are too expensive. So we're going to get to 5,000 megawatts and, and, and we're going to do this um, with big projects. And don't you worry about this, consumers. We're going to solve your problems for you. So don't, don't even think about distributed power. The government's going to do it with big projects. That's, that's 25% of Kenya. 75% of Kenya is off-grid. Now, when we talk of off-grid electricity, we talk of tens of millions of dollars. It is a thriving sector. It's 100% private with a little bit of donor aid, a lot of social entrepreneurs um, who are trying very hard and get a $100,000 grant, and that's a lot for, for some of the companies. But the 75% of the population, there is no government policy for how to expand the off-grid electric people, and so whether it's going to be in 10 years, whether it's going to be 60% or 40%, they're still going to be off-grid, they're still going to be there, but there's no subsidy for the solar systems, there's so, no subsidy for the mini-grids, and the government policy is that we're going to extend the electricity to all these areas, so we're not even going to invest in the solar. So, but on the other hand, chloride tells me that they sell a million car batteries per year, and I'm going to finish pretty soon here. They're going to, they sell a million car batteries per year into the rural household sector. A million car batteries per year. And the amount of money that's spent to recharge those batteries is more than the cost of the batteries. So you have thousands of people in, villa, in town charging those batteries. We have three, four, five hundred thousand solar systems. I, 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 I disagree with some of the, it's, it's a mature sector. This has been going on since the 80s. We have, we, you can buy a solar panel in more places in Kenya than you can in, in California. There are more solar shops where you can buy solar. You can buy it in Tito Ande, you can buy it in Kitsumu, you can buy it in Lodwar, you, you can buy solar in more shops in Kenya than any. So we have a very sophisticated private sector. So we have three or 400,000 solar home systems. We had a million car batteries. Lighting Africa says that we, sent, we sold 700,000 Pico solar systems in the last, in the last four or five years. Now I bought one from my house because I don't have the grid power from the friggin' 5,000 megawatt plants. So a lot of those systems are going to urban. 
Okay, I'm coming to the end here. So, we have a wall between these two sectors, and we are bipolar. We're all sitting here, and do respect to Paul and, and the work he's doing on his off-grid Pico work. He doesn't get any support from the subsidies, but the KPLC contractors get $1,000 per connection on every single connection. This isn't true for Kenya. It's also true for Rwanda. It's true for Tanzania. Average subsidy per grid connection all over Africa is between $500 and $1,000. And we can't give $50 to the off-grid people. So how do we solve this problem? There is a wall between the, the on-grid elite and the off-grid poor. Tear down the wall. Let's make the policy work for, for on-grid and policy work for off-grid. So I'm, I'm all in favor of investment in social entrepreneurs coming out. I'm one. But if you don't have policy to help, to help, um, to help the, 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 the off-grid people who are, who are working very hard to reach the 75% and the people in Kibera that don't have access to electricity too, if you don't have a policy in place, you're going to be doing what? You're going to be writing proposals to Shell Foundation. You're going to be writing proposals to Power Africa. You're going to be writing proposals to every international group because the, the mother, the group that should be taking care of this, which is the Kenya government, isn't taking care of it. We need to change the policy, we need to tear down the wall, we need to say, hey look, rural people have access to that subsidy as well as urban people. And we need to put the framework and policy frameworks in place. And if we can do anything as our group here, we can begin to talk nicely. I, I'm not very nice. I'm impatient, I'm, I'm in the end of my career. But the people who are in the beginning of their careers, we need to have dialogue with the governments and, and break down the wall and have the policy that can make all of this great solar stuff happen and bring solar onto the grid as well. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> um, so, Andrew, if I may, I'll come to you in a minute. I'm actually going to skip to Bobby just quickly. But, Bobby, could you tell us a bit more about the Private Financing Advisory Network and its role in um, helping to enable an ecosystem for rural energy access? Uh, thank, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, my name is uh, Bobby Namiti. I'm the East African Coordinator for this uh, Climate Technology Initiative Private Financing Advisory Network. I'll explain uh, what the network does um, using myself. When I started out, if uh, Project Volpa came to me, I would um, discuss with them and come up with a fee for doing their business plan. After I'd done the plan, then I would find problems with um, getting the payment out. So eventually, when I grew older, I would ask the project developer to, first of all, transfer money into my account before I would do any work for them. Eventually, it meant that there was uh, the chicken and egg. Nothing would move because I could not guarantee that they would get uh, investment into their business plan. And I couldn't because I said, I do for your business plan. That is it. If you can get investment, okay. If you cannot, I cannot guarantee. And they, would, they wouldn't pay because I wouldn't guarantee. In the network... The consultant can now work on a project being guaranteed a small fee by the network without charging the project developer. So that is one of the roles of the network now, that the project developer can get technical assistance, can get support in project development, can get um, risk structuring the project without actually having to pay me, a member of the network, before their project is done. So that is one of the roles of the network. The second role I'm going to use... Uh, discussion that um, Mr. Okia used in the morning here, that uh, the coffers of um, small and um, medium investors are full with shillings. Shillings are literally there, nobody is taking them. And uh, investors on the other part are, have a lot of projects. They cannot actually move. One of the reasons is because uh, the communication and interaction between the project developers and the investors and financiers is minimal or non-existent. If it is, then they are speaking in uh, different languages. If, for example, I spoke to my friend Mark here or Patrick or Andrew in uh, my Bantu dialect, I, I would hardly get through to him. So this is the problem that is existing between uh, the project developers and the investors. The things that the investors want to see in the business plans are not there. So the network helps those investors say those things 
rather the project developers, those things that should be in the business plan, and thereafter, match make and source equity and debt. So those are the two key roles that the network does. Thank you. Okay, keeping the attention there on finance. Um, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind telling us about the approach of Power Africa um, and perhaps more ex um, specifically looking at the kind of challenges that investors and donors are having in setting up in Africa um, and um, helping to invest in clean energy enterprises, please. Great, thank you. It's loud. So Power Africa is President Obama's uh, key initiative for Africa was setting the very high aspirational goal of doubling access to electricity in sub-Saharan Africa. And for all of us, all those of us here sitting up here and those of you in the audience, you know that's an extremely, extremely difficult goal and the estimates of achieving universal access are, are in the range of $300 billion plus. And when we announced this uh, initiative, we made a commitment from the U.S. government for $7 billion, a lot of which is, is loan guarantees and financing. But really what Power Africa is about, it's not about trying to solve the problem ourselves and having the US government try to come in and solve this problem. It's about putting this in the hands of the host governments and letting the host governments control their own energy destiny and putting the problem in the hands of the individuals in the communities and looking for community level solutions that are again letting people be in control of their own energy destiny. So what we see, a lot of these solutions that are off-grid solutions are perfectly bankable, but the investors don't know how to invest in these community solutions. They don't want to take the risk in any one particular project. So one of the approaches that we're taking, for example, is looking at creating funds that will bundle together some of the different off-grid solutions to make them more attractive to, to investments. That's just one of the many approaches that we're looking at taking. But um, more importantly, what Power Africa is doing is we're sitting down with folks like the people here at this table and people like you, and we're trying to find out what are the problems. Rather than coming in and trying to generally look at the sector and then offer an opinion as to what we need to do to solve the problems in the country, we're actually sitting down with the people, with the investors, with the private sector and saying, what are the obstacles from helping you move forward? And I tend to be very, very critical. So even if I look at an off-grid solution, because I've been in development business for a while. I've been in plenty of communities where I go in there and I see dilapidated solar projects that seem to be, like, seem to be a good idea from a particular donor at one time. In fact, one community in the Amazon, I went and there were three different dilapidated systems that were meant to be off-grid solutions. And there's just one little windmill that was still going, but nobody knew how to maintain it or do anything. So what we really need to do is figure out what we can do to support the private sector in a private sector model so that people can try to solve their own problems. And when I talk about controlling your own energy destiny, I'm not talking about 24 hour a day universal access. Often what I'm hearing from people is that how are you gonna get poor people? Poor, poor people are not going to pay for electricity. And I say that's absolutely not true. People find the resources when they wanna find the resources. And I think some people have heard me say this before. If you go to any community in most of the world, in most of the poorest communities, and you look around and you'll see houses that have plastic sheeting and dirt floors, you're likely to see uh, a direct TV or a satellite dish in one of those houses in those communities because for whatever reason, when there's a big soccer game on, people come together and figure out how to get their money together to, to make that happen. It's the same thing with cell phones. I mean, say poor people aren't gonna pay for cell phones and you look at cell phone penetration. People will pay for electricity they may not pay for it, have the, the, the resources to do it 24 hours a day, but they will pay for it for two hours a day so they can be in control of their own destiny and know what two hours of the day they're going to have electricity so they can charge their cell phone, they can study, they can do the things that they need to do. So they're not spending the rest of the time either having nothing or wondering when the electricity is gonna come on. They can go days without electricity. Um, I worked on a project in, in um, Nicaragua about 20 years ago when I was right out of college, and um, actually it was more than 20 years ago, but I'll say 20 years ago. And it was a housing reconstruction project and there was only one phone in the town. And um, we were waiting for materials to apply it to arrive from the capital. And we waited around for four days for the materials to arrive from the capital. But one phone call, because the one phone was actually 
broken down, one phone call could have solved the problem and everybody could have gone on with their business. That's the exact same thing with electricity. When people are wondering when that electricity is going to come on or if they don't have it at all, they're not able to be in control of their lives. And that's what we're working toward doing. So when you hear about Power Africa, our approach is looking at these large transactions, large gas transactions, large wind, large solar and trying to be transformational, trying to figure out what is it that we can do to make it so that these projects are bankable. And a perfect example would be in Tanzania recently, there was a solar project that was five megawatts that wasn't getting the financing that it needed because the standard power purchasing agreement that the government was offering was only 15 years. So Power Africa and other players were putting significant pressure on the government to get them to extend the term, the, the, the tenor of that standard PPA to 20 years, and just recently they extended it to 25 years. So as a result of that, that five megawatt solar project is now going to move forward, but it also opens up the space for other renewable projects. So we're looking at some of those larger solutions, but we're also getting to, we can't ignore the off-grid and the mini-grid. And so we have 12 U.S. government agencies that have many tools, and we have, you know, you referenced a $100,000 grant that the U.S. African Development Foundation just, uh, is, uh, just uh, gave three of them in Kenya for their off-grid challenge. So you have some of those smaller tools, and we can have even smaller ones as well, but we're looking at from our entire mix what we can do and take the best of the tools that we have to offer to try to look for community-level solutions uh, for off-grid. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I want to talk a bit more about um, supply of financing, starting from very early stage and, and moving through but to later stage. So first of all, um, for Richard, would you mind commenting a bit more about or commenting about investment criteria and parameters that have been applied while making investments at early stage for clean energy services? Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, so look, I guess the first point to make is that um, even though we are using grant as our primary financial instrument, uh, we will still approach, um, you know, potential partners uh, and analyze investments and allocation of resources as an investor would. Um, our approach to analyzing risk and analyzing market opportunities is very similar. Um, the other point I'd make is that we deliberately have a very small portfolio of partners. Um, and that has all to do with what we set out to do in the first place, which is to uh, catalyze change, a, a, a scale, it's essentially about scale. So it's about the uh, ambition, both from our side and from our partner side, to achieve both sustainability and a global um, large scale impact. And for us that means we have to have patience, we have to have flexibility, um, you know, it's a, a significant size of grant uh, investment, um, and equally um, there's, a, there's a significant non-financial um, resource that we commit to our partners. So. Um, by restricting our portfolio to say between 16 and 20 social enterprises, all pioneers in their field, um, we're able to provide that uh, element of non-financial and, and the size and time horizon of, of support that's required. Um, so what are we looking for? We're looking for uh, entrepreneurs who have a disruptive um, te technology or a disruptive model that can um, address a market failure in the energy value chain, a major market failure. Um, and what unites probably all of our um, social enterprise partners is both our belief in their ability to achieve global scale of impact and earn their own income and become financially viable, but also that when we're talking and discussing, really no one else will touch them. You know, it's very, very early stage, very, very high risk. They are first movers in totally new categories. Um, some examples are actually in the room of, of very early stage partners. I think Patrick mentioned that I would challenge your assertion that you're not innovative, Patrick, because what we're doing together uh, is essentially creating a working capital facility for energy uh, SMEs to, to engage and activate new distribution channels, um, which is a major barrier to scale for, for inclusive energy businesses. Um, there's other uh, new partners in the room that look at, for example, pricing and trading social impact. Um, and equally, uh, to, uh, ways to accelerate the commercialization of, of new energy technologies. The, the only, probably last point that I would make is that the single biggest factor that we have found as a determinant of success is probably not the technology or the model, but the people or the team behind that idea. Um, so if, we, if I think about how we approach and have approached over the last 14 years our, um, our uh, efforts towards better and better partner selection. I think we, we kind of approach uh, matching up with a partner as a marriage, and that means dating first. 
So we'll, we'll, um, we'll pilot extensively. We'll try to understand new technologies, new models, new markets. But the realization over that, a, long, a long time in trying to do this and then trying to invest significant resource in one pioneer um, is that the sort of single most common reason behind failure is not the technology, the idea, the market, the, the business model, but the capacity to execute a business plan. Um, so I guess uh, what we're looking for is that shared vision. It's a track record of actually having sold something in the past and having commercial experience in addition and, and married to a, a deep understanding of the market and the development need um, and a recognition from both sides that business plans do change. So you really back teams and not the plan itself. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off piste and I've got the pleasure of having um, Alex in the room, Alex Bashian from Investor Development. Could we possibly get a microphone to him? Um, thank you. So, Alex, um, if you could briefly just introduce Investor Development and give us your um, opinion on why there needs to be new innovative ways of structuring deals here rather than the traditional forms perhaps and what those challenges, what challenges those new specialized funds are trying to overcome. Thank you. That's right, I get that a lot, at least in the last couple of years. Um, so I'm Alex Bastian, I'm with a firm called Invested Development. Uh, we're an impact, uh, impact fund, is this, uh, is this all right? Um, an impact fund um, focused on the energy sector as well as um, agriculture and ICT. Um, I mean, we look at products and services for underserved populations in emerging markets. Um, we've been particularly focused on Sub-Saharan Africa and East Africa over the last few years, but also invest um, in India and Latin America. Um, so, and well, sort of to get right to Charlotte's point, I won't take too long. Um, we're, you know, we've been a tech-focused fund, so we've looked at, um, uh, as the gentleman from, from Shell mentioned, sort of disruptive technologies um, for the last three and a half years. Um, but in the last you know, year and a half, we've seen, um, we've found ourselves sort of continuously being brought back into this circle of trying to understand and tackle the distribution um, and financing issue, which a lot of companies um, are facing. Um, a lot of companies have struggled to solve the distribution problem, and that's linked to, um, to providing of the right service for the customer, not just the product. Um, you know, there aren't that many uh, disruptive technologies as standalone sort of solutions um, certainly being, being created uh, in, in these markets. Um, there's certainly some tech transfer from overseas, um, but the main problem we've seen recurring time and time again is distribution and servicing to a customer that you understand and, and, and appropriately providing um, uh, a relevant uh, product or technology. Um, and, uh, and I think over the last year or so, um, we've seen a lot of really good examples of, um, of enterprises providing, solving the distribution and servicing problem um, to their end clients. And this is across, you know, cook stoves, solar, biogas, um, and, uh, and others. Um, there's definitely a lot of activity in East Africa uh, but some of these distribution companies are doing, are doing great things in, in 10 plus countries in, in sub-Saharan. And, um, and I think the reason why they might not be growing as fast as they can, and some of them are growing, growing quite fast, is, um, is access to, uh, to additional financing to get them from sort of the early stage to the growth stage. Um, and a lot of that has to come with creating innovative financing mechanisms for them um, around the working capital problem and CapEx problem. Um, for them to, to cover what a lot of them, to solve for them what a lot of them have to cover internally, which is sort of that credit extension to the end user, uh, because the formal sort of banking sector isn't providing that. So for investors, it's about being innovative 
Um, for entrepreneurs, I think, I think there's really a lot of enterprises out there. They're getting some good support at the early stage. There's a bit of a gap in between the sort of early stage seed and, and growth stage. stage. Um, and, and, and the market will be served well by more, more people coming in and trying to provide for, for that segment. Thanks, Alex. Ooh, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, back up to the panel. Um, one last question specific around financing for Patrick. Uh, that sort of later growth stage um, at responsibility, what specialized funds are you creating to try to overcome this? Any particular key challenges? Um, yeah, so basically thanks to Shell Foundation and uh, companies like Invested Development, entrepreneurs, or to my left, I mean, you get, you get companies that figure out how to distribute, how to finance uh, products. And as um, uh, Alex pointed out, one of the key challenges now to really take off is the, the working capital side. Um, so basically if you come from a generalist fund, you don't understand the problem properly, you, uh, you're probably not set up to, to exactly um, Pluck this gap, and so basically, now with different partners, we're setting up a working capital facility, which should, uh, yeah, exactly uh, face this or uh, solve this problem. And the idea is now not to be, I mean, be innovative about the solution for that, but it's then it's not going towards the the new startups and finding new solution, but it's basically making the successful businesses larger and therefore, I mean, having a bigger impact and um, getting to more people. And so that we uh, get to, yeah, can break down this wall a little bit, crack at a time. Because we are investors, we're not policy makers, we play our role. So, um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, we, we really need to focus on what we're good at. Um, okay, just while Patrick's got the, the mic, um, what is your view in the future about the push towards adopting more global impact metrics? Is there a large role for that in your new funds? Um. Um, the whole impact thing. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's at the moment there's a lot of pu uh, push towards more, you know, proving that we have impact, that we, you know, we generate big spreadsheets on with indicators, etc. We are distracting entrepreneurs from doing what they have to do. So I think, I mean, we as fund managers, we are pushing back to the, our investors. Um, we're pushing back a lot because this is not donations, what we do. Uh, it's, yeah, we, the basic, the key metric of, of investment is a successful business. And so I think what I would say on the, on the impact side, measuring impact side, let's sit together, um, let's find on a high level um, mechanics how, for example, an, in, an investment in a solar company impacts the rural poor or the, 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 the urban poor. Explain that to investors, to, our, like, to the asset owners, I think they're called in this setup. And I mean, Interestingly, interestingly enough, they're smart. They they listen. They get the point that you know if you, you know if you have electricity for four hours, it's better than having one hour. And so, basically, that means as soon as I got that, we can just counting figures and say, anyway, hundred thousand uh, households reached a million. And I think the, the idea is not only to reach a million, but tens of millions, and we should not be distracted uh, with details, but let's uh, get the big thing right. Um, we're going to move on to the Q&A in a minute, but I've just got a couple more questions for the panel, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, Bobby, um, looking to the future, what, what do you see at the Private Financing Advisory Network can be short and medium term solutions to help build the ecosystem further? considering what you've heard today from the panel. Uh, thank you. In uh, the short term, we're looking at um, strengthening the network by uh, including more members 
and uh, increasing the outreach and ensuring that we can, as much as possible, bring in project developers to benefit from uh, the services that are available. In the long term, we are looking at um, getting in touch with the initiatives uh, like uh, Powering Africa to be able to leverage those resources and uh, help up the project developers that we have in the network to be able to develop the projects and actually implement them. Because it is quite sad if uh, year after year you have uh, this project developer that is uh, vending this project, yes, looking for finance, yes. So we need to find a way that uh, we can close off all these projects. Then there are a lot of um, private funds that are actually in country, yes. But uh, when you look at uh, the way they are utilized, many times these funds are used to buy uh, treasury bills and bonds, and nobody wants to put this money into energy projects. So in the long term, we are working with um, various stakeholders like uh, UNCDF to be able to unlock, using uh, innovative ways, this domestic financing that is available to make it available to investment into energy projects. Then uh, finally, we currently, we actually reliant uh, on um, donor funding from USAID and RIP, but we are looking for a way to, to sustainably have this platform in place such that even if the donor funding runs out, we do not uh, tell the project developers that uh, we are sorry, now we cannot help you because we don't have any more funds. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, Andrew, so based on what you've heard, um, what do you think um, funding institutions and governments can do in the short to medium term to work better together to create this enabling ecosystem? So, resources, I mean, it depends on which sector you're talking about, but really the idea behind Power Africa is it needs to be a private sector driven uh, development of the sector. Because you don't want the governments, we've seen this in Liberia where you've got about a billion and a half dollars in, in donor funding going into a Liberia a country that's got 23 megawatts of electricity and it completely distorts the market. If you're a small player going in there trying to, trying to sell your products and suddenly the government or some hev heavily subsidized program comes in, it basically puts you out of business and so there's so many changes. Our money is really best spent creating financing opportunities for the private sector. Our money's best spent finding out from the private sector what are the challenges they're facing. Sometimes the challenges they're facing, in fact, frequently, they're, polit they're, they're policy challenges. I gave the example of the, of the um, standard power purchasing agreement for renewables being too short. So what can you do to get them to extend that? Sometimes the problem is a particular individual in a ministry who just doesn't know what they're doing. And it's a political solution, having to make the right calls to the right people, or trying to build that person's capacity. What we're seeing in Ethiopia, for example, uh, we have this transformational project, the Corbetti Geothermal, which is 1,000 megawatts, the first time that the Ethiopian government's ever done an IPP. We need to make sure that that works. We need to make sure that the Ethiopian government has the confidence to negotiate the PPA with a big geothermal company and I feel like they were taken advantage of so making sure that they have the capacity to be able to do that so that they are comfortable with other private sector deals. So in my opinion governments should be spending their money on building capacity, on making sure there's financing opportunities to bridge those gaps and, and making some really tough political decisions, making some tough decisions related to, to the cost of tariffs. I mean in the six power Africa countries that we have, Kenya, Liberia, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Nigeria, and Ghana, the tariffs are all over the place and they're all taking different approaches, but having really working towards cost reflective tariffs and also having feed in tariffs or renewables that, that, that give them a little bit of a leg up to move forward. Um, so w will there be a position in the medium term maybe where Power Africa will be working more to support um, service providers at off-grid energy at the, sort of that smaller scale? Um, so, so that's what I mentioned. We've got 12 different U.S. government agencies and they all offer different products. And one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at the off-grid. Um, we're looking at all the different programs that we already have and trying to figure out what the best of the best is. We also don't want to be tripping over what other donors and governments are doing. So we're getting ready to launch a partnership with the World Bank. World Bank's got Lighting Africa. You've got the, the SE for All. 
we don't want to be reinventing the wheel. We don't want to be competing with him. So we're trying to look at what all the different partners are doing and trying to figure out what's the best, what's working, while at the same time not trying to distort the market. Because in the long run, it's the market that's going to drive the development of the off-grid sector. Great. I think that's the quote of the day, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, quote of the day. Um, so we're going to open up to the floor. Um, any questions you have, you could stick your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, Gentleman with the orange shirt, first of all, please, and then we'll move to the left too. Thank you. Thank you. If you could direct your question to an individual on the panel, that would be great, or, or to me, and I can help. Okay. Now I'm on. Great. Um, I have a question. Um, so I, I have a biogas company. But I'm not talking about cooking fuel now. I want to talk about electricity. Uh, nuclear power. Uh, it's often considered not a renewable energy, unsafe, but I believe it's a very safe energy source. Uh, it can be very cheap as well. So I direct this to Charlotte to, to find the best people on the panel to address this, but how can we leverage uh, nuclear power in the medium term probably to connect more people with more affordable electricity that's going to last uh, a very long time? And how does that fit into uh, the investment framework, or is nuclear too um, ugly of an energy source uh, for the foreseeable future? Does anyone want to take that, or shall I? Andrew, do you want to start? And, and look, nuclear is not ugly. Nuclear is expensive and it's complicated, and um, there are other solutions that I think that um, the countries that where, 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 where we're sitting the countries have incredible resources that are a lot easier for them to capture. We're, we're not in some remote, I mean, there is gas, there is wind, the Lake Turkana Plains are some of the windiest places in the world. You have incredible solar resources, you have incredible hydro resources, the DRC, yeah, I mean, the East Africa Rift Valley has 15,000 megawatts at least of clean, sustainable power. And there is the technology to capture that. The question is, is how do you get investors from all over the world to want to invest in the Rift Valley instead of investing in Latin America and Asia because they're safer places for them to invest or they, it's easier for someone to go to their board and say, I've got a project in Malaysia than it is to say, I've got a project in Djibouti. Because a lot of these companies are public companies and you're not going to be the guy who goes and tells your board that this is where you want to, to invest because everyone's going to laugh at you and say, why would I take that risk when there's other things that are more proven methods? So our job is to figure out how do we do a better sales job and, and help, help the governments here do a better sales job and explain why this is a good investment. And we got to get them to the point where it truly is a good investment. I think nuclear, sure. I mean, at some point, maybe. But I just don't, I think there's too many, there's too much low-hanging fruit in Africa right now, at least in the countries where we're working, that um, we're not focusing our resources there. So, hi, my name is Per Löberg. I'm from Emerging Cooking Solutions, and uh, we just got the pilot innovation grant from uh, and the Global Alliance. And I just want to ask you a little bit how you see what, what your thoughts are about energy mixture, because we, we work with basically cooking fuel, which we believe is, is a very important part of the energy need in Africa. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a very new technology at all. I, I would say it's sort of disruptive tech transfer from the northern part of the world. It's very easy, actually, compared to making ethanol or building nuclear power plants. And uh, I'm just wondering if you think about this, because uh, in Lusaka, for example, also this, this applies to the on-grid need for electricity. In Lusaka, where we are, uh, they have load shedding, simply because everyone cooks at the same time. And so there's not electricity enough to keep the electric cookers, even for those who have. So I'm just I'm curious about your thoughts about that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, what was your technology again that you're talking about? We are very. We are pelletizing uh, agricultural and forestry waste, and we use those. We use that in uh, wood gas stoves. I don't want to beat my policy drum again, but Tanzania has had a government policy of reducing um, biomass use uh, over the last 20 years. 
in the last 15, 20 years, they've actually relatively, they've increased their use of wood and charcoal as a percentage of the population. So the, the policy that they have in place is not working. And um, so, so and, and Tanzania and Uganda were both wood surplus countries. This is changing. Kenya doesn't have any wood left. So I, I think cooking solutions are really, really important and we, we need to start thinking much more, much more about it. And this comes back to the 25 versus the 75%. Um, the 75% rely on wood, wood and charcoal and government policies do not really support them. And, and if you don't have government policies, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna throw in what happened with cell phones. If anyone here was, 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 was around when we had 400,000 or 300,000 connections in Kenya and you had to go in and bribe 10 people to get a phone line in your, in your office, then you knew how difficult life was. And even I had a band and trying to organize five band members to come to one, one venue um, without cell phones. I don't know how I, how I did it. There were policy changed and, and um, suddenly we have mobile phones and 27 million cell phones in Kenya. Policy change. Policy change on, 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 on electricity and electrification strategies, but also wood fuel and, and fuel strategies to support people who can, um, uh, now my final thing will be, the biggest cash transaction between rich and uh, urban and rural people in East Africa is charcoal sales. Rural people are screwed. They make the charcoal, they get dirty, they sell it to unscrupulous transporters who make, the, make all the money, and the rural people produce the fuels, they, they deforest their, their farmland, and the urban people cook their food. This has to change. So I, I, I think it comes down to policies. Investors, we can't ignore it. Investors have to go and talk to the government and say, we want to invest in you to come and bring a pellet solution, because I think pellet, biogas, it's, it's not going to be one, it's going to be 10. It's going to be L LNG and L LPG. But we really need to have a variety of solutions. And what we have right now is wood for rural people and, and charcoal for urban people. Nobody cooks with electricity in Kenya, or very few people. OK. So policy. Yeah. Um, we've just got a few more minutes left. So Paul and Patrick, um, if you wanted to make some comments. And then we may have time for one more question from the floor. But we'll just see. Yeah. Hello. Uh, sorry. I think. Uh, just having listened to you, and uh, I think I had a, had a reply to Mark earlier on the issue of uh, off-grid and uh, <clears throat> on-grid on policy. I still feel that market inconsistency provides an opportunity for manufacturers like us. So we are happy. Uh, I don't know how long it will take the Kenya government to get everybody on-grid. But in the meantime, I'll be happy to serve that uh, end of the market with my products. Uh, I think the, the, the only advice I would give you on hood fuel is uh, private sector approach distribution. He's spoken about mobile phones. The success of all these brands is on distribution. Whoever gets it right will get it right. And whoever gets it right at this time will basically be the leader. You're talking about uh, M. Copper. Andrew spoke about having the power when you want it. It's affordable. And I think M. Copa is leading the space in pay as you go. What is their key differentiator? Other than the people and the commercial experience, it's distribution. So I think even Hood Fuel, I know of a product that came into the market about two years ago. Today they are they're roughly almost hitting a million. And I think one of the founders is in one of the afternoon panels. And I will be happy to, 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 to introduce him to you and he can share with you what has made them successful. Very simple, distribution. So I think the magic in some of these challenges lies in getting the distribution model right, and whoever gets it will get there. Thank you. Yeah, in investor perspective, so um, I think, yeah, food, uh, fuels, great. If we can get it right, I think technology at the moment is not the key issue. Key issue is distribution, uh, not easy. Um, so for us as a later stage investor, if we see someone, you know, distributing successfully, hitting one, two, three million dollars in revenue, very, very happy to do that, to, to finance you. 
Unfortunately, our investors don't allow us to help you to figure it out. There are other investors, uh, you know, like Investor Development Shell Foundation, that basically invest in you to, uh, yeah, to figure the details out and then happy to grow with you. I'm just going to make a quick point here. <clears throat> so, I, I, just to sum up some of these things, we, there are so many interesting ideas out there, and I think that's fantastic, and lots of innovation happening. Um, but at the end of the day, this is, these are issues that affect billions of people. You know, three billion people are affected by energy issues. 1.6 billion people lack access to reliable, affordable, modern energy products and services. But in 2030, despite all the investment that will no doubt take place into on-grid solutions and, and, other, and other options, uh, there will still be, on current trends, you know, over two billion people who are suffering from these problems. So at some stage, we need to also think about a system-level approach to sorting this out. You know, it's great that there's all this innovation happening. I think that's perfect. We're coming here together as a social investment ecosystem, as a community. You know, there's social enterprises here. There are different types of social investors, development finance. You know, there's um, impact investors. There are foundations here. There's governments will play a role. Corporates will play a role and have already. And I think, I, I just think that we should move beyond as well just talking about collaboration and finding real ways to coordinate with each other. Um, there are some interesting examples of how you can use financial instruments, and we talked about some earlier, um, blended um, investment structures to bring in different types of investment to take uh, solutions to scale. Um, but then there's an important market building role to create the infrastructure, so codify best practice, create regulation, create standards, create policy change to ensure that um, these new solutions are actually pioneers for opening up new markets so we can address the big barriers to scale um, at a system level. So I think uh, in addition to attention on new ideas and biogas is interesting, hydro is interesting, um, you know, off-grid, mini-grids are extremely interesting, we also need to say what is working now and how do we scale that up. Thanks, you did a good summary for me, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I, mean, I think I've got to wrap up now, unfortunately. Um, if you have any other questions, perhaps you can direct them to the panelists individually. Um, so we've, we've heard a lot today. Um, if we start at the, the consumer end, we, we, need, it seems we need to focus attention on the off-grid consumer. Um, and there is demand, significant amount of demand for power. Um, there's a lot of money being spent in uh, accessing energy already in the off-grid area. It's, a, it's a, a large addressable market, recurring revenue potential. Um, we need affordable services for the, for the um, base of the pyramid. The way you achieve that is going to be a combination, I think, of, of technologies um, as well as business models and service delivery. They could be new technologies, as, as you were talking about with um, cooking, or it could be old technologies in terms of mobile technology, SIM chips and um, using GSM networks to, for remote monitoring of systems, but putting them into new, new business models and um, ensuring there's a good sort of service um, element to that. Um, we've talked a lot about, about financing, and I think there's clearly a need for very different kinds of financing at different points in development stage um, of enterprises. And most of the enterprises we're talking about here are startups. So they're going to be facing the typical challenges the startup faces, but also they're in, in markets um, that are risky from, for very different reasons for certain um, investors. So there's a role for grants, um, there's a role for certainly for working capital. Um, and then I'm back, back to policy and trying to sort of help have, help have that to sort of unite everything together into an ecosystem. Um, a lot more to talk about. We just touched on it today. Um, directing attention specifically to the off-grid market. Um, helping entrepreneurs through things like better VAT, um, other sort of um, making it cheaper for them to actually run their business and helping them along the way to larger scale policy integration for, for institutions perhaps. Um, so I think that's 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 been a great day, um, great panel. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I'm just going to pass back to the MC. Thank you, Charlotte, our esteemed panelists, and our expert resource, Alex, for this great session. 
On behalf of Sankal Forum Africa and IntelliGap, I would request Charlotte to give away a small uh, token of our appreciation to the panelists. Bobby Namiti. Alex, uh, can you please come up on stage? We have one for you. Sir. Thank you. With this, we come to the end of our panel discussion. Thank you once again, everyone. Uh, now we can proceed for networking and lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>